today, I an old stutterer. I have really had serious pro problem with stuttering in my youth. I'm going to read to you three short stories. Okay, not more. It's, it's on the edge of what you can take. <laughs> because uh, I have written them myself. They are not like literature masterpieces. But they are all connected to, 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 to this house. That's why I read it. Then we can discuss later on in what way. It's about King Eric the Fourteenth and his beloved Karin Mons daughter, who also became Queen for a very short time. It's autumn, and the blue color abandons the leaves of the trees and disappears up into the sky, turning the leaves yellow and the sky deep blue. A strong wind moves along Vita Berrien in Stockholm, where August Strindberg stands painting. The wind hurls the leaves in spirals into the air. The restless atmosphere is suitable for painting, not for writing. Strindberg brushes away the dancing leaves with his paintbrush, and a few droplets of paint fly off and land on a leaf. The paint seems to give the, ex the leaf extra energy. It's thrown further up in, in the air, and is caught by a strong gust which carries it eastwards, towards Finland, towards Turku. The city towers up like a grey silent wall of stone against the Russian Empire. A part of Finland, the godforsaken and lost part of the Swedish kingdom. Strindberg sees the leaf disappear, then returns to his reveries of canvas and paint. The great walls of Turku castle tumble away when Eric XIV outlines Karin Monstotter's contours with a light hand on a dirt-colored slip of paper. She's so beautiful, so soft, with a voice that creates music in his head. There is no dawn or drawn line <laughs> that can equal his memory of her naked body when it shivers in the chill of the morning. But the drawing, despite its clumsiness, makes her presence real to him. And the very activity of drawing provides a moment of release from the disturbing thoughts that, the form, that form like clouds in his mind, at times like these, storming those insensitive walls. At moments he can smell her skin as she emerges from batting in the sea, but it's soon replaced by the smell of dank stone, sweat and wood that surrounds him, filling his body with rentless fear. He will never see her again. Looking out through the buried window to the far side of the river provides no peace. She lives there. Even from here he can distinguish the small human creatures, ant-like in the distance, impossible to control. One of them might be even her, Karin Monsbottom. King Eric XIV looks out through the prison window and sees a leaf that has reached higher than the others, twirling outside the bars, beyond the glass pane. Suddenly it's stuck flat against the glass, like a herald for the mild and weak, its strong veins forming a geometrical pattern. He puts aside the piece of charcoal he's been drawing with and reaches towards the window. With his forefinger, he draws out the contours of a heart around the shape of the leaf where it clings on the outside. He bends forward and gives it a kiss. The surface of the leaf seems to come alive. The veins turn into small paths, the dark flecks into houses, the colors into fields and meadows. He sees a little house in which he and Karin are hiding, far from the fortresses of power. The house takes its shapes from the leaf and melts into the scents and shapes of the air and woods around it. Then the storm unfurls itself. 
over the landscape and lashes of rainwater grasp at the leaf on the prison window. The leaf loses its grip and is thrown once more into the wind, which carries it over the Aura River to the far shore. There, it drifts gently down into a quiet valley in front of a wooded cliff. So we have the leaf here, and we have the leaf there, and we have the castle of Turku on the other side. And now uh, the second story is about the very famous scientist, Tarkal. And I'm going to move to this greenhouse, which is made for Tarkal, who actually was the first scientist writing about American nature scientific researches. Barcow. It was extremely warm and the stench of the city was unbearable. Even though the worst heat of summer was long past. So as to get some fresh air and make a last inspection before the winter, Professor Barcow had decided to row across the garden that he has created out on Sipsala Manor in Hirvensala, an island in the river, outside the river Aura. The garden was an outlying annex to the botanical utility garden that he, together with Johan Lehe, had created near the Turku Cathedral in 1757. After all the problems that he had had during the summer germinating the seeds he had collected in America, it was necessary to carry out the hibernation correctly. Despite all his efforts, to pr protect the plants from frost, he knew that many of them would probably not survive. Yet it was worth the effort. Khan decided not to row all the way, but to go ashore by the little village opposite the castle, and then make the rest of the journey on foot. He knew that in the Renaissance, the castle had been a residence, modest, but still unique and impressive in a poor country like Finland. Now it served only as a prison, and no longer for kings, as before, but for criminals. Come on, criminals. Gollum was an optimist. He believed that by investing in science and education, a better future was possible, even in a country at the periphery of civilization, like Finland. That is why it was important to make sure that the garden would flourish. His vision was that it would be feasible to develop useful plants that can stand this climate, and he had the university's full support to explore new cultivation methods. Kalm started walking along the road into the woods toward, towards Sipsalo, thinking fondly about the garden's rational, geometrical structure. When he noticed how illogical and organic the route of the winding road was, it should really have been striped. Then we had saved some time. There is beauty in simplicity, he thought. His botanical utility garden was shaped around a rectangle of the, uh, divine geometry that distinguishes us from nature. Mankind is, after all, the pinnacle of creation. He breathed in the scent of hundreds of different flowers and trees. Just then, he was reminded of his physical existence by a pressure in his groin. He had to stop to relieve himself. He stood in a clearing where some wild apple trees were growing, half hazardly directing the stream of his urine to the south, to the sun, which had just appeared from behind the gray clouds, which made it glow strangely. At the same moment, 
He thought he saw an object gleaming on the ground a short distance away. It was not easy to discern, obscured as it was by a particularly driving stock of giant hogweed. Furthermore, the ground in which it grew had an oddly familiar human shape, the shape of a woman lying just beneath the soil. Buttoning his trousers, Column pushed into the giant hogweed towards the spot. Using his walking stick to strike at a particularly large plant, he broke its stem and was immediately enveloped, enveloped by an indescribably sweet and sour odor. His nostrils dilated and he staggered back, gasping, gasping for breath. His last sensation was of a rainfall of small, sharp needles shooting from the stem of the giant hogweed and the liquid that flowed over him in an unbridled stream. So that was the death of Tarkal. And uh, the hogweeds are plants which you usually must take away when you start building a house. They are poisonous, especially for, for small kids. So now we, when we built the leaf house, we also had to take them away. But now they are actually living on as ornaments on the, on the what, do you call, what do you call it, uh, the base, basement of the house. So you can check it when you go in. And uh, now to the last story before the wine is coming. <laughs> Last story, we go, we go, we go to Brazil. There is a, a I was, I was uh, doing a project in, in Sao Paulo, and I, I actually went to, to a, a small island outside the coast of, 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 of Brazil. Afterwards, in Porto Seguro. And uh, it was a, a, a ferry. You can see this, this blue ferry. I'm riding. And, uh, I, I'd like to transfer this uh, experience of, of traveling on this ferry to the house. So the one part, this part here is, is influenced by, by this Brazilian ferry. And I have written stories uh, which have affected the building, and that's why I'm reading them for you. <coughs> because I, I think it's, uh, it's one way of, of designing. The Blue Ferry. The little boy lies on a hill. In the bright moonlight of the Brazilian night, the hill is not black, but white. His father has disappeared, gone with Alzheimer's into the silence. The boy gazes up at the stars that look different here in the southern hemisphere than they do in the north. He turns his head 100, 180 degrees and admires the silence that speaks from the outer space in the steaming night that smells of hot sand palm leaves, decaying wood, and from oil from the generator in the village. He remains slumbering the whole night on the sand. In the morning, he's woken up by a colibri that has stopped in mid-air in front of his eyes. Everything is still, safe in ultra-rapid. Today, the boy is due to go to meet a teacher who works with the children in the little village on the island of the Brazilian coast. He sets off, but when he reaches the place where the school is supposed to be, 
The only thing he sees is a big tree. Then he hears water coming from the tree and discovers a group of children, 10 of them sitting on the branches. One by one, they jump down onto the ground, followed by their teacher, a young woman from Sao Paulo, who has come here as a volunteer to teach the children. Why, yes, the school works in the tree, she says. But we also have a table with benches here next to it, where we can work with paper and pencil. The boy sits down and starts drawing what looks <laughs> what life looks like in a country that has ice and snow. Meanwhile, the other children draw their reality with colorful fish, turtles, and canoes. After some time, the boy leaves school, carrying in his mind images of sun and sand, leaving behind a sheet of drawings filled with black, white, gray, and blue. The boy wanders for a long time along the abandoned sandy beach with the oceans, ocean on one side and the impenetrable jungle on the other. He sees no one except for one man who approaches him wielding a huge machete. But the man passes by without pausing or saying a word, just as a woodsman might back home in cold old Finland. The boy reaches a village that has a ferry connection to the next island. The ferry only goes a couple of times a day and is just about to leave. It's small, made of iron, its deck a rectangular plate on which wooden benches are fastened, just like in a church. Blue painted posts sprout from the deck, holding up a roof. The boy sits down among the other passengers, mostly very dark-skinned women dressed in white. The ferry chugs slowly out from the harbor. The boy thinks of his father, a ship's captain, who sailed the seven seas. He remembers seeing photos of his father, tarred black, a ritual that was carried out on a cargo ship whenever they crossed the equator, heading south. Now, in a way, he feels his following in his father's voyaging footsteps, but doing it in his own way. The, way, the boy wakes from his daydream and discovers that the ferry is no longer heading towards the next island, but out into the open sea, to the Atlantic Ocean. He also notices that nobody else is with him anymore. The ferry moves forward, ghost-like, the coast behind disappearing, and the waves ahead growing bigger. This was the way that the Portuguese had come when they first arrived in South America. Now the boy is heading on the same route, but in reverse, back straight towards Africa. The little ferry moves steadily onwards under the huge blue sky. Okay. And uh, what are we doing here in this strange garden? Uh, Perhaps somebody of you have noticed that uh, this, these green walls are uh, like the hexagonal structure. And that's the way I planned our next house. One-to-one uh, -one in the garden, letting it, the, the walls grow up and see how it will function. And here you see the, the, the scale model of the hexagonal house. Um, and uh, this table, is actually exactly in, in the kitchen where it is supposed to be when the house gets ready. Uh, except for my, my, my wife who thinks it's too big <laughs> for the space. Uh, but anyway, it's, uh, this is one way of, of planning. And um, I have been working for 25 years with, with architect Erki Pitkaranta, uh, where, where we use uh, play, stories, um, fantasy, things like this as, as a starting point for, for our buildings. And that's why 
a model also is, is a very good way because you can do collaboration on a model on on, on 3d drawings it's, it's very much more difficult so we it's easy to cut off to add to, to repaint on a, on, a, on a scale model and then afterwards uh, everything is uh, scanned and, and transferred into to computer language what about this that's uh, that's the staircase to the to the upper floor, <laughs> <laughs> and you are sitting in the in the toilet, oh. <laughs> and you are sitting in a technical <laughs> room, and you, you are actually the kitchen. <laughs> the part here. So this is a, a small this is a test because um, this house uh, it, it it's it's um, it's so difficult to build that you, you need to have a very skilled builders. It's, it's unique in that way that you, 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 you just can't say to anybody else to do this because it's, it's way, way too, too, too difficult to do in reality. Here, this is easy. Uh, but now, the, this, in this house, uh, I wanted to, to try out, uh, like, can you use organic shape for with uh, with straight lines and actually uh, nature doesn't do rectangles but it does hexagonals so that's that's the easiest actually the cheapest <laughs> important the cheapest way of doing organic shape is is a hexagonal shape also en energetically very 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 good and very stable and this is going to be uh, made made with uh, it's a special kind of log which is uh, one, cent one, one seven centimeter log, and then it's emptiness, and then it's one seven centimeter log. This is kind of element with, uh, then you fill this uh, empty space with, with wood, uh, mass, wood mass after that. So it will be, it will be a, like a totally uh, zero energy house if you have good windows. And uh, this will be earth, earth, earth roof. We hope this is under planning. There. This will not be exactly here. And uh, this house is, is, is going to be turned into a residency after two years, if we get this ready. For art, art, artists and uh, academic researchers. And it, it's also my PhD at the Academy of Fine Arts, the house. And now, uh, because buildings are something you need to see and this is not possible to see through video. So we will now go inside and you, you, you can experience it. And there is a lot of wine and food. And what about the other structures that are behind? Uh, yeah. Uh, this white one is uh, it's a Danish artist group called N55, N55 who, who makes uh, very very simple structure for, for living. So you can download their instructions from internet. They have instructions for everything. Made very 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 cheap. So, so this is uh, their one man uh, one person apartment. <laughs> It's not really made for finish <laughs> because of the insulation problems. But Mario, Mario, my 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 my, my friend and wife <laughs> uh, has uh, just recently restored it, so it, it doesn't have any any furniture inside. There is actually a bench where you can sleep and also use as a as a working bench. And these guys, they, they they live in these kind of structures. They they add more of this if they want to have to grow bigger. They have versions we have with, which have feet, so they can move the whole house. And very interesting artist. And uh, the, the the onion uh, pumpkin sauna is a, is a sounding sauna, uh, and it has a sound sound work by my friend Sean Decker, who is uh, also a professor at the Chicago Art Institute at the Art and Tech Department, and we have been working also for. 25 years, uh, and 
so if you throw water on the heater, it, it, it creates one, one, one changing soundscape inside the sauna, but also we have speakers <laughs> up there, <laughs> and they have very funny sounds like old steam whistles. <laughs> so people who drive and bike by, so they, they, they certainly hear when we are. <laughs> but now it's filled with the stuff which earlier was in, in, inside the N55, so it's no use. We can't use it, otherwise it would have been great to have a sauna also. Mm -hmm. uh, Mario is very tight that I cannot speak too much. <laughs> so let's go inside, we can continue. And, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.